Chapter 34, Jeffrey. You know those Rambo movies where Sylvester Stallone runs around some dirtbag communist country with no shirt on and shoots down a helicopter with a slingshot and kills 237 communist soldiers with his bare hands? Those movies are unrealistic. Here's what reality is like. Horkman and I are on one side of the ravine, holding our guns over our heads. The Cubans are on the other side, going nuts, shouting, ee ready to go kick some ass. In a movie, the next scene, we're all charging into battle. But what actually happened was, first, Horkman and I had to climb down our side of the ravine, which was hard because those guns are a lot heavier than they look. Plus, it was really steep. We both kept dropping the guns and falling down, so we ended up mostly sliding on our butts, which took a while. The Cubans tried to keep cheering, but after a while, they realized they better pace themselves. Like, every 20 seconds or so, or so one of them would go, yee But you could tell they were losing the mood. Plus, <clears throat> I'm just going to come right out and say this. <laughs> I... I had to go to the bathroom. I mean, bad, which is something that never happens in the movies. You never see Rambo going to the bathroom. You never see what's his name, the guy in those Bourne movies, Matt Damon, when he and his co-star Hot Babe are fleeing some foreign country and he's killing enemy agents with kung fu, speaking nine languages, hot wiring a car, and driving like a stuntman, stuntman, etc. You never hear him say to the babe, "Geez, I'm sorry," but even though those enemy agents are like. 20 yards behind us shooting at us i need to make a pit stop because if i don't get to a toilet right now i'm going to turn this car into a septic tank that's the way i felt when horkman and i got to the bottom of the ravine i had a cramp in my gut like i was about to give birth to a walrus i had no choice but to drop my pants right there and then what are you doing horkman said what does it look like i'm doing i said You can't at least go behind something, he said. Go behind what, asshole? I said, because A, there was nothing to go behind, and B, Horkman is an asshole. I don't believe this, said Horkman. He walked about ten yards and sat down on a rock, facing away. (laughs) Thanks a lot, douche nozzle. So there I was squatting, and I don't want to get too specific here, but it was a severe fire hose situation. (laughs) I was, <laughs> I was splattering <laughs> the gravel big time. Plus, there was a certain <laughs> amount of gas noise. Plus, you had the natural echo in the ravine. I don't think this is what the Cubans were expecting in the way of military leadership. I could hear them up there talking about me, and then one of them went, yee, 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 definitely sarcastically, and then they were all laughing. Assholes. Like, they never had diarrhea in a ravine. I fire hose for what I would say a good three minutes off and on. (laughs) When I was finally done, I realized I had nothing to wipe with. And, of course, Horkman was no help because he's an asshole. I looked up at the Cubans, but I didn't see Ramon or Nunez. Just a bunch of morons who didn't speak English. I yelled... Tango, toilet paper I don't know the Spanish word for toilet paper. Not that it would have made any difference, because they probably haven't had toilet paper in Cuba since 1964. So, of course, the idiot Cubans didn't know what the hell I was talking about. They pointed at my ass and made a wiping motion, which they thought was very funny. Ha ha, yee, jerk-offs. But finally, they got the point and threw down some kind of big jungle leaves. I wasn't too happy about that, because... I remembered a situation at the 1983 Northeastern New Jersey Boy Scout Council Campery when this kid in my troop, Lenny Vitale, wiped his ass with some leaves that turned out to be poison sumac. And by the time they got him to the hospital, according to his brother Victor, his butt was the size of a truck tire. But I figured I had no choice. And I put myself as best I could, and then Horkman and I started up the other side of the ravine. It took us even longer than going down did, but we finally made it to the top. Nunez was waiting for us. I must ask you, he said, how did you survive the attack? I confess that when I saw the truck explode, I feared the worst. Horkman gave me a nudge. I looked at him and he shook his head, indicating, don't say anything about the salamanders. 
I gave him the finger, indicating, fuck you. Then I looked back at Nunez and said, you ever heard of Born? Who, he said? Born, I said, like the Born identity, the Born extremity, etc. No, he said. It's a special kind of agent training, I said. Born training. We train for this situation. You train for going off a cliff in a truck, he said. Exactly, I said. Impressive, he said. <clears throat> yes, I agreed. Ramon came out of the jungle and said, We must go. We have lost time. We got into a different truck, Ramon and Nunez in the front seat, Horkman and me behind them. The convoy started up and we were bouncing down the road again, if you can call it a road, going maybe two miles an hour. Horkman leaned over to me and, keeping his voice low, said, While you were making the river of poop, I did some thinking. Good for you, I said. Listen to me, Peckerman, this is important. Why do you think the salamanders let us go? What do you mean? I mean, we're supposed to be wanted terrorists, right? Wanted by the United States? I nodded. Well, they're United States military. Why didn't they kill us or capture us? Why'd they save you and give us both of us guns and send us back to the rebels? We already discussed this, Horkman. They're secret, what do you call it, operators. They're helping the rebels overthrow the government. That makes no sense, he said. What do you mean? The salamanders saw us up close. They know we're not military threats. I think they know we're just a couple of schlubs from New Jersey. I had to nod. He's an asshole, but he had a point. The salamanders didn't seem impressed with us. So, continued Horkman, why they send us back over to lead the rebels? I shook my head. I think, said Horkman, they want to make sure that the rebels lose. Why? I don't know, but it's pretty obvious they're not on the rebels' side. Didn't even let the rebels see them. In fact, it wouldn't surprise me if once the battle starts, the salamanders are fighting against us. I thought about that. So they're going to let us go in there and get killed? Horkman nodded and said, I think they might even help kill us. If there's one rule that I always try to live by, it's this. Don't get killed. I knew I had to do something. In the seat ahead, Nunez and Ramon had their backs to us. I glanced behind. There were three Cubans in the back seat, but they were all dozing. Behind our truck were some more, but they were a ways back, and there were dust clouds on the road. I moved over toward the edge of the seat. What are you doing? whispered Horkman. I'm getting the fuck out of here, I said. Bad idea, said Horkman. He pointed toward the trees. I looked. There were dark shapes moving in there, keeping pace with the truck, the salamanders. As I watched, one of them came closer to the road so I could see his face. It was the guy who saved me, Spider-Man. He pointed at the road, then shook his finger back and forth, indicating, don't get off the truck. Then he reached down and pulled something out of his boot. It was a really big knife. He held it up, indicating, I have a really big knife. With his other hand, he pointed two fingers at his eyes, then one at me, indicating, I'm watching you. I slid back into the middle of the truck, leaned over, and put my head in my hands, indicating, fuck me.